All right, what's up? Welcome. It's another day stream. I enjoy the day streams because it turns out the audience is actually pretty active from like two to five. And uh, I guess that's why Jim Bob streams at this time. I hope I'm not interrupting uh, Jim Bob. He seems to have been streaming for a while, so uh, I figured it would be a little bit before we actually got started. And the... <clears throat> There's always something happening. Like every time I'm about to start a stream every day, it's like, oh, suddenly there's this faux crisis uh, with whatever's going on with annoying things like bills and whatnot. <clears throat> I've also added, of course, the uh, the Bitcoin uh, wallet to support. If you want to support, you can do so via the Bitcoin wallet that is in the show description. I've had various Bitcoin links there before. Uh, and then I always forget to put up a new address. So there's that. And I think I will add the QR for those that don't know. You can also support and send Bitcoin via these convenient QR codes. So if you want to support via BTC, there's the QR right there. And maybe I should make it sensible by putting it in the right spot. So today I thought I was in the mood for open forum. And as you know, the way open forum usually works is that we <clears throat> open it up for anybody who has a disagreement, a challenge, a topic to debate. You can have the floor. You can speak for as long as you'd like within reason. That means that you can't hog the microphone, ramble about nonsense for an hour. It means that you get the microphone to make arguments. That means that you present some kind of thesis, some kind of supporting evidence, some kind of logical argument. There's different types of arguments. Different things are proven in different ways, as we've pointed out many times. So you're welcome to do that. If you don't do that, you will not last very long. I will call you out. I will bring you back to the point. I will not let you continue to ramble. You're going to accuse me of being mean, say that I'm interrupting. I'm going to be interrupting and calling you back to the point when you're not making an argument. I'm not interrupting for the sake of interrupting. You have to make consistent, coherent, logical, cogent arguments. There is elements of debate which are called rhetoric. There are elements. That includes joking around, jabs, making fun at times. That's part of rhetoric. If you can't handle that, then you're not prepared for actual formal debate. So we're going to hold you to the standards of the way classical formal debates usually go. That does not mean you act soy. It doesn't mean that you act like you're, I don't know what, some sort of disgusting, distasteful Pharisee, whatever. All of that stuff is zero tolerance policy here. We don't negotiate with, we don't negotiate with the Pharisees. We don't negotiate with Pharisees. With all your mustard gashes. So, the topics today have nothing to do with the Middle East and Middle East politics. Although, there might be elements of evangelical theology like refuting a dispensationalism or premillennial Zionism. Those things are relevant, but we're not here to talk about Tiny Mustache Man, his followers... Uh, we're not here to talk about geopolitical conspiracies. We're not here to talk about wine mom poetry hour. I don't need to hear your new rap bars. I don't care about your rap bars. And they're not as good as mine anyway. Uh, the topics are the topics listed. And inevitably, there will be people popping in who don't care, don't pay attention to the topics. They will hop in here and get mad because they'll say, what is this stream about? What are you even doing? Even though it's giant bold text listed at the top that it's a debate. Oh, why are you trying to debate me? You me. It says debate at the top of the thing. That doesn't mean you have to debate. You can also <clears throat> ask questions. That's perfectly acceptable. So we open it up. And that means anybody can come on. And I do this all the time because 
I get DMs all the time. People ask me for private tutoring. They ask me for uh, private messaging. I don't have any time for any of that. So we get like hundreds of DMs and emails nowadays. I don't have time to ferret through all this stuff. I can't reply to all these people. So you can call in. And I typically sit here for hours doing this. So there's really no excuses unless you just act like a complete loon and I block you. There's really no excuse for thinking that he won't interact with nobody. I do this more than anyone else. No one else sits here for hours opening it up to argue with the audience boys and girls. But that's like, girls are like 2% of the audience anyway. <clears throat> so, topics listed today to be specific. Obviously, the generic topics are you a Protestant? You're an evangelical. You want to present your arguments against my position. You're a Roman Catholic. You want to prove the papacy, whatever. You're an atheist. You want to defend your naturalism, your materialism. You're a Muslim. You want to defend your position. You think you got it right. <clears throat> you are uh, some sort of weird anti-Trinitarian cult, black Hebrew Israelite, Hebrew roots, uh, Unitarian, Jehovah's Witness, Mormon, etc., etc., you're welcome to request to speak. How does this work? Let's go through the rules and remind everyone again that when I give you the microphone, it will be muted. This is how Twitter spaces automatically work. You have to unmute yourself. Don't make me sit here and say 500 times, you got to unmute, dude. Even though we all know that I will have to sit here for 500 times and say unmute, dude. So we can just accept it that that's the reality. And that nobody's going to remember or realize that they have to unmute themselves. So <clears throat> that's how it works. They should just kind of, I mean, I guess it makes sense why you're automatically muted when you come on. You might be, I don't know, pooping or doing something weird. I don't poop. I don't know what you weirdo people do, but I'm above all of that. Um, so, you know, if you can't control, if you got potty problems, maybe this isn't the debate for you. Maybe you should go watch those stupid YouTube ads about how to unclog the poop that's been in your rectum for eight years or whatever they claim. That doesn't seem plausible to me, by the way. It seems like you'd die if that was the case. So I feel like I feel like that's not a legitimate product selling point. I feel like that's false advertising. Anyway, like and share. I mean, are you everybody's just saying in the question question marks in the chat? You don't get those. I get those ads all the time. I don't know why I'm not searching poop stuff. So I don't know why those ads pop up on my YouTube, but, um, it's that one dude that like hipster looking dude, hipster looking gen X millennial dude. He's like, do you have like 12 feet of backed up poop in your colon? You probably do. So like you can't get it out unless you use this product. Anyway, we're not talking about that today. Uh, we're going to talk about serious stuff to a degree, because, but I'm sure we're going to get some wild people. It never fails. Well, sometimes it fails because it, some days it's completely feral people, feral hill people. Uh, some days it's wine moms, drunk. And then some days it's just serious questions. Some days it's angry people. Who knows what we're going to get? It's always like a Russian roulette of madness. And that's, that's okay. We can handle that here. So request to speak. You'll be in the line. Uh, I will go to you one by one. And uh, let's keep it to the topics. Oh, yeah. More specific topics. Things like the Trinity, transcendental arguments. Things like Logos, Logi. Things like biblical theology. The Old Testament, uh, its theology. Quran, Islam. Uh continuity between uh, Old Testament and uh, Islam, uh, evangelical views, modern evangelical churches, tradition, scripture, sola scriptura, trip, scripture alone, sola fide, Luther, Calvin, Calvinism, predestinarianism, and on and on and on and on and on are all acceptable topics today. Remember, those are the topics and something adjacent to that. So please don't come on here asking about conspiracies and movies. We're not talking about that today. And if you talk about conspiracies and movies and ask me about that, I'm immediately going to move on. So don't get mad. Get your feelings hurt. Get all butt hurt. He's so mean. All right. First up is uh, uh, Anurav. And by the way, I've got Isaiah pulled up because um, I'm reading through Isaiah again. I sort of go in this circle of constantly reading through 
Isaiah over and over, which is great because, as you don't, if you don't know, Isaiah is the fifth gospel. And uh, the more you read Isaiah, the more you realize why it was called that, why there's so many Messianic prophecies, so many prophecies of the church, which proves the Messianic prophecies, so many prophecies of, um, the, well, not necessarily prophecies, but statements of the Trinity. I mean, the Trinity is all through Isaiah. And so it's, it's becoming more and more, I think, of a go-to source uh, for me. <clears throat> Because, uh, you know, Ezekiel has multiple Trinitarian passages, uh, multiple deity of Christ passages. However, Ezekiel is a very mysterious book uh, for, I think, most people, for everyone. And Isaiah is a much more for forward book. It's a much more um, straightforward, to the point, you know, Messianic prophecies, relationship of the Messiah to the nations, uh and, and quite a few, actually, uh, quite a few statements about uh, Babylon, spiritual Babylon. Um, you know, if you read the book of Revelation, you understand how important that uh, the spiritual Babylon, spiritual whoredom that's discussed of that city, the spiritual city there. And uh, there's quite a few passages that St. John in the book of Revelation is playing on from the book of Isaiah especially. I, I was just reading uh, after liturgy the other day, Isaiah 47, uh, which is almost perfectly a mirror to Revelation 18. So <clears throat> clearly John, as we know, is pulling from uh, all, all, all manner of places in the Old Testament. A, a lot of Leviticus that people don't know about, John is pulling from that in the book of Revelation. Uh, John is also pulling from Ezekiel, uh, and Isaiah. So we also, you can support the show via the Streamlabs super chats throughout the show. This above me is the Bitcoin uh, QR code if you want to support via Bitcoin. Uh, the wallet address is also in the show description. First up today is uh, he's looking like a little tight tape bro over here with that smooth, slick look. Looking like he's about to step into the octagon and do some uh some ballet dance moves anarav what's up anarav hi doing jay yes nice sir talking to you again. hey man all right um did we have we talked before we have we have okay. like about about a, about a month ago okay. um i have a question specifically about tag again tag uh, I, really ah. like, <laughs> I really like the i really like the argument um and I just think it's really abstract, though. So, and I am coming from like a philosophy minor background, and I still find it kind of difficult to understand sometimes. Um, and that's obviously why I come to you. My question is: We talk about time, right, as universal. I'm confused as to: Okay, are we saying that time is not justifiable without God? Um, and if so, how does time then prove the existence of God? Um, I think. I think Kant takes that from Aristotle's categories in some situation. Let's see. I've got categories here right in front of me. And uh, <clears throat> let's see what Aristotle lists as the categories, because that's where Kant gets categories listed. Aristotle lists um, uh, forms of speech, predicating uh, from forms of speech. They're either simple or composite. He lists... Uh, let's see. Oh, here, I'm sorry, excuse me. Here, here's the list of the categories. He says, substance, quantity, quality, relation, place, time, position, state, action, affection. So um, I think that we could, without getting too wild in our philosophical speculations and debates, I think we could safely say that it does make sense that time would be one of the uh, preconditions of knowledge, one of the categories that would be preconditions. Yes. Okay, and then so you t and then also what we talked about before, and with I I just need you to point me in the right direction. You don't have to answer it like get crazy now. Um, when we talk about the preconditions for knowledge, mm -hmm. I mean for logic, uh, meta logic, and how it proves the ex that itself proves the existence of God. What um do you have like anything I could like? Can you clarify that right now? Or is there anything you can point me in direction to to like look that Yeah, up? we've done multiple streams on this. Like you could look at the top 10 objections to the Transcendental Argument stream. Okay. You could look yeah, at the yeah. stream that I did critiquing uh, Dr. Ed Fazer where I talked about universals. But basically when you start 
admitting that the categories exist. Okay, so let's go back to Aristotle's list of these categories, right? Substance, mm -hmm. quantity, quality, relation, place, time, position, state, action, affection. If you think about those categories as examples, they don't uh, operate or exist in isolation. So they're holistic. They go together. And if they go together, then what's the grounding for all those things together? And that's where I make the argument to the move to ground it is then the Christian metaphysic, the universe, the world created by the triune God. That kind of a world grounds this list of 10 categories using Aristotle as the example. Yeah, I mean, I made that argument to someone before, and then they went into absurdity, and they said, okay, you say you can ground it in God, right? These different things. Why can't I ground it in a turtle, for example? And I know you're because like, a turtle doesn't do right? the turtle doesn't do any of the metaphysical work that the Christian worldview does. So that'd be as, right. as stupid as thinking that the Christian worldview, which is the basic uh, ideas of Christian epistemology, Christian ethics, Christian metaphysics. The idea is that, <clears throat> that that would be the equivalent to just saying a turtle is completely stupid. Right, because it's not a turtle anymore if it transcends all of these things, right? Your friend doesn't it's, understand yeah. that it's an argument about worldviews, two competing worldviews. Yeah. It, wasn't, it wasn't a friend, it was someone online. Okay, what, you know, was, yeah, yeah, but it's, it's a cringe thing because walks like a duck, talks like a duck, it's a duck, right? So then it's not a turtle anymore at that point. But I see. What, but obviously, you know. Oh, you mean is, you mean is he saying what if I said that a turtle is a triune god that has the ability? That, well, if they said something like that, like we had a guy, yeah. like we had a guy in the in the Discord like six years ago, and he was trying to make a big <clears throat> argument like this, where he was like, "Oh, uh, what if I take all of your positions and just say that it's some, um, you know, Odin god? It's a triune, right, 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 uh, exactly. Wotan Odin deity who, but." The point is that the, the argument for our position also includes history. So it include, it's an entire worldview. It's not an abstract math problem. It's saying that the entire Christian worldview, which includes the Christian account of history, that means that Jesus stepped into time and space. That means that the triune God is a revelation from Christ. So it's, it could not be something copied and pasted by a dude on Reddit who would clearly be borrowing from the previous uh, historical Christian tradition. Do you see how it would just be an obvious fact? Right, right. It's kind of like you're borrowing from morality when you, when we say God is unethical, but then in that you presuppose what ethics is, and that's not possible without God. Yeah, right? but I'm just yeah, but I'm saying history is also part of the worldview. We don't have an ahistorical, abstracted notion of what a worldview is. It's not a math problem. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, okay. it includes the history of the church. It includes. What you see right here on the screen in Isaiah. Isaiah is part of this historical revelation. And Isaiah here is in this Messianic prophecy, for example. I am the first. I am the last. Again, hearkening to the terminology of John in the book of Revelation. Identifying Christ as the Messiah. Christ as divine. And he says that I laid the foundations of the earth. So this means Jesus created the earth. Because Jesus is the Alpha and Omega, according to John. Jesus is the creator. Then it goes down to say that... Um, all the nations assemble against the Lord, listen to the Lord. And he says, I've not spoken in secret. I've spoken from the beginning. I was there. And now Yahweh and his spirit have sent me. So this is a messianic prophecy, Christ speaking and saying, Yahweh and his spirit have sent me. That's the Trinity. And he's identified as the Alpha Omega, like four verses earlier. So, I know you're not primarily asking about the Trinity, but I'm saying that if I think about what the quote Christian worldview is, it includes people like Isaiah. It includes Isaiah's messianic prophecies and these statements about who the Messiah is stepping into time and space, the second person of the Godhead in time and space. That is part of the worldview. So it could not, this could not then be equated to a person saying, oh, well, I have all your metaphysical positions, but it's Odin and not the Trinity and Jesus. Right, right. That 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 puts it perfectly. All right, AJ, I'll let someone else um, ask a question, but thank you. Always yeah, great questions. Uh, that question comes up quite a bit. So yeah, I, appreciate, thank you. I appreciate you uh, re-bringing it up. Colt. Colt Savage is next up. Colt Savage. Sounds like a wild cowboy. Oh, oh I'm out. Are you Colt Savage? Yes, sir. 
What's on your mind, man? Um, so, first of all, thank you for having me on. Uh, I wanted to ask you a question about the Trinity. So, I come from a Protestant background, so I'm just beginning to learn these things. I'm only 23, so I'm very young and inexperienced on these topics. So. Okay. Like, I've done my first read-through on the Bible, Orthodox canon, by the way. Uh-huh. So, I've read, like, the three Maccabees. Okay. So, in your discussion with Redeemed Zoomer, something I noticed that you said that the Filiuque, if you believe that, that opens the door to Macedonianism. And before I let you, you know, respond, I just wanted to, this is something I was just thinking about on this issue because something I noticed is that, you know, I was watching an Orthodox YouTuber on heresy. When Macedonians came, I was like, what? I'm, I'm a heretic? The, the Holy Spirit's a person, not a heretic? What are you talking about? And I was like, I don't want to be a heretic. Like, what are you talking about? And something interesting I've learned over these years is that I've noticed in Western Christendom, the divinity of the Holy Spirit is kind of seen more as lip service than reality. I mean, there's so many people that get mad at you. Right. Deny that it, yeah. Sorry, were you going to say something? No, I'm just agreeing and saying absolutely that's a, an unintended effect, correct? Yeah, because I've, I've even heard some people who don't know any better, they'll say, well, you know, Jesus is the son of the Father, and then they'll say the Holy Spirit's like the grandson of what do, you, what do you mean, grandson? It doesn't say that anywhere. Right. Yeah, exactly. And I'm just, yeah, again, I'm too inexperienced to, to say, oh, well, I think the Filioque is true or not. But the, the main question I wanted to get is that, is there any way you can get the Filioque without falling into the Macedonian heresy? Any way that you can get it? What do you mean? Or is, is there any way you can hold to the Filioque without really embracing Macedonianism? Well, I think most people who believe the Filioque don't intend that. So, but I think that the point is is rather that many people. Are, could you mute when you're not talking? It's really loud background noise. Just just when you're not speaking. Yeah. So I think a lot of people um, are better than their theology, right? Because their intentions are obviously not to, obviously not to believe in Macedonianism or the <clears throat> diminished ontological status of the spirit. Uh, I think that they just are kind of working with systems and structures that they've inherited through whatever they're raised with, be it Protestant or Roman Catholic. And then as they get deeper and deeper into the issues and they realize it's a little bit complex, then typically they're kind of trying to make this thing work, right? Like, I don't know, like, like Matt Damon when he's, you know, the janitor and he walks in and he's trying to make that big math problem work and Goodwill Hunting or whatever. So, and then they realize that contrary to the Matt Damon example, it, it doesn't actually end up working out. So the, the, the basic issues with how we get, uh, the, I mean, it, it really vindicates the critique originally from uh, St. Photius in the Mystagogy, which is that if you have a, a shared um, hypostatic property, which is supposed to pick out the persons, if the son shares in that property with the father, then now you really have a dyad because you have this power this property that two of the two that two persons share that the other doesn't and in trinitarian theology according to the cappadocians um, something's either unique to the persons or it's common to all three you can't have something that two have and one doesn't that's pretty much impossible and so it leads to a dyad where the father and the son are a co-eternal principle together of the production of the spirit that's the terminology from Lyons and florence Nothing to do with eternal manifestation there, but but specifically about uh, eternal uh, ex- existential procession, and so that's why it leads to a dyad. That's the key issue, and uh, the other thing is that um, that dyad then leads to an ontological diminished status of the Holy Spirit. So that's where the critique, the Macedonian critique, comes in. And every time a Roman Catholic or a person hears this, they freak out. I don't believe that the Holy Spirit is last three. Yeah, we know you don't think that. We're saying that the position leads to that if you were consistent. So really, it's just a confusion ultimately of the distinctions between nature, person, will, and energy. And I would direct everyone to, um, although it's not discussing the Filioque, although St. Gregory Palamas does have a book that is built on the argumentation of St. Photius in the Mystagogy called the Apodictic Treatise on the Holy Spirit, which is ripping the Filioque to shreds. <clears throat> this book, which is available, uh, Gregory Palamas and the four Palamite synods are all translated. All four are translated. I read it on the plane back from hanging out with Sam Hyde. And uh, you'll notice as you read through the, the translations of the Palamite synods that 
oh, they make all the arguments I make. So one of those key arguments, which is, again, not directly about the filioque, but indirectly addressing the root confusion, is the confusion of the distinction between nature, person, will, and energy, NPWE. So I have about 10 places where I marked in my notes, NPWE, where the Palamite synods are taking the argumentation from St. Gregory Palamas that the Latins consistently confuse nature, person, will, and energy because they're real, they're real metaphysical in the sense of actually being in God distinctions. And metaphysical distinction doesn't mean separation or division. God's not separated because he has distinctions any more than distinguishing the Father and the Son means that they're separated. So um, so that's the my rundown on on that. But you could also go read the Sashensky book on the Filioque if you want to take it to the next level. All right, uh, just one more thing. Um, I, I, in one of your past streams, you know, you talked about how the second person, Jesus, was also the God in the Old Testament, you know, uh, Yahweh, I am he. Well, I, I mean, I just say, covered this chapter right here. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say real quick, I appreciate you talking about this because I've actually been reading through the Old Testament again, and the Old Testament makes a lot more sense with this distinction because, Absolutely. you know, Growing up, I was thinking, why would the father just do all this stuff in the Old Testament? Like, did he, like, get tired, take a break, say, yo, son, take this over? It makes a lot more sense when you read the Old Testament with the second, with the second person of the Godhead being the God in the Old Testament. And oh, I was yeah. just reading through Isaiah um, yeah, um, yesterday, and now I'm reading through Jeremiah. And one thing, and just one more thing, um, I know a lot of Calvinists, I'm not a Calvinist, by the way, I don't believe in that nonsense, Um They talk about how Romans 9 is evidence for predestination and the, you know, like God's already decided your outcome. And I'm just thinking, well, that's a load of nonsense because salvation, heaven and hell are not mentioned in that chapter. And I was just wondering, what is your take on that? Yeah, so I think if you read uh, the path, can you mute or go ahead and uh, leave the space just because the background noise is low. Yeah, I think that once you understand that Christology is... Trinity and Christology come first in your order of theology and not the divine decree, then a lot of this stuff kind of works itself out. Because if you look at Isaiah 45, which (coughs) I think Paul is pulling from Isaiah 45 in part. And Isaiah 45 is talking about um, the collective relationship between Jacob and Esau. (coughs) <clears throat> and, and Paul's whole uh, context for a lot of this is the relationship between Jew and Gentile. So although I understand that Jacob and Esau were individuals, <clears throat> the idea that the uh, eternal destiny is what's in view here in terms of individuals, I don't think is Paul's primary point. God does foreknow all events, but that doesn't mean that God is the direct cause of all events. And this is an issue that uh, Islam, for example, is uh, very proud of because they adopted a metaphysic that's called occasionalism, or at least m- many Sunnis, maybe not all of them. I don't think, for example, Jake doesn't believe in occasionalism. But occasionalism just means, like a, most Calvinists would say, that God is the direct de- cause of every event. In other words, every event is Im- is immediately caused by the divine decree. And so <clears throat> while it seems on the fir- surface of it that passages like Romans 9 might uh, lend credence to that, if you rewind and step back for a minute and think about like Ephesians, for example, when Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, he's not writing to the elect. I'm Orthodox. So stop spamming the chat uh, or you're just going to get muted. If you stand one more, if you spend one more time, you're gone. So you should be obvious. It should be obvious how to figure All right, You're done. You're gone. Get rid of this guy. This is super annoying. It's, it's constant mental illness. Anyway, so when he writes to the church at Ephesus, he's writing to a visible community of baptized people. He's not writing to the invisibly known only to God elect. And if you understand that in that vantage point, then, hey, wait a minute. If he's writing to the visible church at Ephesus, then why is he calling them the predestined? Strictly speaking, the predestined, a la uh, Ephesians 1, they could only be... um, it could only be written to the invisible elect. And, you know, most Calvinists think that ultimately the only people who are reading and understanding the texts uh, are the invisible elect, the predestined, right? The unconditionally elect. And so they really are the recipients. But you don't actually see this in Paul's epistles 
right? Like he's writing to this church at Ephesus with a bishop, Bishop Timothy, by the way. And then he's like, wink, wink, saying, oh, but by the way, I'm not actually writing to the church at Ephesus. <laughs> wink, wink. We all know who I'm really writing to. Right, John Calvin? Right, bro? No, it's written to the visible church at Ephesus who are called the predestined body of Christ. But you notice that every Calvinist has to say, no, wait a minute, it's not actually written to the visible body of Christ because they're not a visible body of Christ. The real body of Christ is invisible. Oh, that's that sounds a lot like a guy named Nestorius. And it's just taking Nestorianism and applying it to ecclesiology, whereas Nestorius is a heterodox Christology applied to the person of Christ, and that Christ wasn't really <clears throat> uh, embodied in his human nature, but rather there, there was two subjects, a uh, eternal divine logos and this human person or subject, Jesus of Nazareth. So it's a dual subject Christology, which is a result of a move very similar to predestinarianism, very similar to Calvinism. I'm not saying that Nestorius was identical to, to Calvinism, but his, his views of uh, Christology are actually mirrored by many Calvinists inadvertently. And if you want a good book on that, just read John McGuckin's book, St. Cyril of Alexandria and the Christological Controversy. So hopefully that kind of clears things up. It just has to do with resetting your approach to theology rather than starting your order of theology like the like calvinists do with the divine decree your order of theology begins with christology or trinitarian oh, theology you. which be, which leads to christology so yeah and just one more thing i'm sorry i, I wasn't trying to get rid of you already you can you can pop back in but i had already hit <clears throat> um yeah go ahead with what's your last point Oh, sorry. Um, it's okay. I was just gonna... Sorry, I was just going to say thank you for having me on. Sure. Yeah, and I mean, you can go to uh, my Clips channel, uh, not my Clips, my personal Clips channel, not Kyle's Clips channel. You could go to um, uh, Live Streams and Absurdities, and I have two, uh, I have like four hours of lectures going through Calvinism. So, J. Dyer, Comic Calvinism, I've done the same talk for Sam Shamoon's channel four or five hours going critiquing Calvinism. Abu Muhammad, I wonder what religion we have here. Calvinism or Islam, actually made pretty much the same thing. <clears throat> Cal Cal is Calvislam, go ahead. That's a joke. Got to unmute, man. One, 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 equal unmute. Are you there? Abu Muhammad, we really want to hear about how Trinity Pagan. All right, well, we can't hear you. You're not, you didn't turn your microphone on, so we can't hear you, man. Morale Law, what's up, dude? <clears throat> Thank you for those super chats, everybody. <clears throat> you got to turn your mic on, dude, if you want to come back. I don't care. We got um, some super chats. Super chat. Super freaky. Let's see. I'm trying to find the first one. King Theoden of Rohan. He's tweeting from, from a, the horse lord is tweeting me from the back of a noble steed. Jay, my boomer tech can't figure out water spaces all you got to do is go over there and get in the room there's literally nothing to it please consider me i would like to come on and disagree bro i want you to the front of the line so king theodon of rohan hop down off of that noble steed and get in the twitter space uh, listen boomer all it takes is literally clicking with your thumb into the room there's nothing required except for maybe turning on your microphone which i'm sure is basically a giant engineering feat if you're a boomer figuring out how to turn on your microphone for the X app. So uh, it's just a joke. Relax. Uh, but yeah, we want you in here, King Theoden. Andrew G, $2. Are you training kids on Bayzid precept so that they can demolish the future slow boy children? I don't think we're going to have to worry about future slow boy children getting demolished. They're going to demolish themselves. Noah M, $5. 
I set my foot in the door of the Orthodox Church through David Bentley Hart. I'm sorry, but that's great that you're uh, in the church. I let go of universalism. There you go. Awesome. This was the hardest intellectual hurdle for, for me. Now, look, that's pretty much everybody. It, it, I mean, maybe for you it was that issue. But look, all of us, when we convert, uh, go through multiple periods of having a hard time with various issues and giving them up. It's just part of the process. I mean, I had, I don't know, what was the last? <clears throat> oh, you're, gonna, you're just going to have different theologically challenging issues. And that's true for everybody. Can we legitimately hope that all people can be saved? I mean, we can, but <clears throat> doesn't mean that they will. All right, so let's see. Muhammad is back. Let's see what, what we got. He's a Maturidi uh, Abu Muhammad. You got to unmute, man. You're on. You're up. Says you're open. Speak. I don't. You're. You don't have a mic turned on or something, man. We, there's no sound. So, try again. Next up. Uh. Iskender or something. Looks like a dude just got out of the shower. Um, um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, hi, Jay. Yo, how's it going? Um, I'm a fellow Orthodox Christian from Southeastern Europe, and I, I have a very brief question to you. Okay. Um, uh, can you please remind the audience about uh, St. Gregory Palama, specifically his uh, prophetic argument against Catholics, that by rejecting mysticism, the doctrine will inevitably lead west to atheism? Yes. Can you please elaborate on these arguments against the Latins? In you. fact, uh, I was kind of surprised to see that argument re repeated in two of the t repeat the argument that it will lead to atheism because <clears throat> um, the main point of this argument is just simply that the reason it will eventually lead to that is because the conclusions of the both Thomistic and Barleyamite system and they have differing views Barleyam was uh, more of an eastern minded monk but he shares a lot of the theological presuppositions of the Thomists, particularly on the point of whether or not in this life we have a direct perception and experience of the divine energies, or whether we are only experiencing created effects of God. And that's the key point where the logic of the of both St. Gregory Palamas and many of his, especially the uh, dialogue with the Barleyamite, and in the Palamite synods, um, they repeat the argument that this will eventually, if you're consistent with that presupposition, lead you to atheism because you're no longer ever experiencing. It's not just the fact that you're not experiencing God directly. If you're only experiencing created effects, then you don't really know which of the created effects, which are right analogs for the attributes. Okay, so I'm not directly experiencing the uncreated energy of divine love. I'm supposedly only experiencing a created effect that I'm calling love, and if all of the created effects in reality are identical amongst themselves and with the divine essence, which is the Roman Catholic Thomistic position, then this leads to uh, an eventual atheism if you were consistent with it. So this is repeated, I recall, at least twice in the Palamite synods. And remember, Palamite synods, in the Orthodox view, would trump even the personal writings of St. Gregory Palamas. I'm not suggesting that they're out of accord with one another. I'm just simply saying that the synods would constitute more authority than any individual. Yeah, I mean, thank you for, for answering the question. And I mean, it's crazy how the Catholic Church has fallen, you know, today. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's literally in that exact uh, position that St. Gregory Palamas predicted it would be in. And it's uh, because they chose to be a geopolitical power and force uh, over um, maintaining true theological healing faith. Uh, and that's that's been the criticism for a thousand years. <clears throat> also, keep in mind that, uh, as I wrote in my substack, the final tomos of 1368 
literally condemns the position of the monk Prokhoros, who tried to argue that the Thomas view and the Palamite view could be reconciled by saying that the distinctions in God are purely conceptual. And so this means that everybody's trying to say that the Palamite position is also a purely conceptual distinction is condemned in the fourth Palamite Synod, the Synod, the Tomos of 1368. And uh, it goes on, by the way, to reject a whole host of other Thomistic arguments. And so if you have the book right here, this is on pages 424 and 425. So that pretty much puts an end to the lying deceptive argument of the Uniates and the Ecumenists and the Thomists that we can reconcile Palamism and uh, Thomism or Roman Catholic dogma on divine simplicity. These, these two groups at this time are excommunicating and calling each other heretics. So we don't even have to get into the minutia of the theology and the, the what level of scholastic distinction is this. It doesn't even matter because the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated the people that had the Palamite position via Lyons and Florence. And now these people are saints, quote unquote, in the Roman Catholic Church. But you can be a Nestorian and be a saint now in the Roman Catholic Church, as Jimmy Aiken and Trent Horn say. So does that not prove that this whole position is based around papal power and has nothing to do with the actual theology? How could you be a heretic for centuries and then have the whole thing reversed and now you're a saint? This proves that they're wrong. Yeah, again, thank you very much, Jay. And, uh, you know, have a nice evening. Thank you very much, yeah. Who does it prove wrong? Doctrine evolved. Yeah, if doctrine evolves, then history evolves too, doesn't it? Leonid, what's up, Leonid? Thank you guys for uh, these. Noah M., my wife and our 18 month son, brother, myself, we're being Hello. baptized. Hey. What's Hello. Up? Yeah, I have uh, like, uh, I'm not come here to debate. I have like uh, two, two questions, like okay. minor questions. Okay. Like, first of all, you, you belong to, to the Russian Orthodox Church, right? Mm hmm. And uh, like, uh, why you choose specifically like the Russian Orthodox Church? Are you Russian? No. Because that, that was the best church in the area, and I uh, ended up finding my spiritual father there. So you like part of uh, Patriarch uh, Kirill flock? Uh, well, Rokor is fairly independent, but they're in communion with Kirill. Ah, okay. Okay, so to my main question, uh, if like uh, the the people before the before the Torah, before Mount Sinai, mm -hmm. like Noah and uh, Enoch, mm -hmm. if they are able to be saved without uh, the law, the Old Testament laws, and without the New Testament covenant. So why do we need the, the whole story? Why do we need any of them? Yeah, well, this is a, right. This, so this is a, hold on. So this is a fundamental misunderstanding. First of all, no one was saved by Old Testament laws. You could never be saved by Old Testament laws. It didn't matter whether pre-Sinai or post-Sinai. Laws could never save you. Paul makes this argument multiple times in Romans. The only way to be saved is through the Messiah. The Old Testament saints were all saved by Jesus, literally. Jesus was the one in the Garden of Eden. Jesus was who was walking and talking to Abraham. Jesus is who met Moses on Mount Sinai. Jesus is who appeared to Manoah. This is fundamental to Orthodox theology. Yeah, but like uh, if you read in Genesis 5, uh, Enoch was taken uh, taken like uh, to heaven before Jesus and before the Torah. No, he's taken to paradise. And that's why uh, there's two people, Enoch and Elijah, who were taken, who have not yet died. So that's why Revelation says that at some point they will die. Ah. So they are, they are alive still? Yeah. Wow. Interesting. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good questions. Yeah, those are, uh, uh, you know, questions that come up that are always good to uh, reaffirm and re-answer that, um, yeah, we do have, 
we do have the same salvation. That's why Paul says that uh, uh, the Old Testament saints had the gospel preached to them. The gospel. And this is the chief error of the premillennial goobers and the dispensationalists who think that there was some separate way to be saved. Uh, complete nonsense. New Wandu. You got to unmute, bro. Oh, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. How right. you doing? Could you please... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really good. Could you please expand on the previous point you made about Elijah and Enoch coming back? Well, I think the, the book of, of Revelation chooses them at some point to be the martyrs when they preach, right? And then they undergo a martyr's death because they are the two people that haven't yet died. So they were taken to paradise, which is not identical to heaven, heaven. Um, and so they will undergo martyrdom to then be resurrected uh, at the last day. So would paradise be Hades or Sheol? No, in fact, when uh, Jesus went to Hades, he took those souls to paradise. Well, oh, he took those souls to heaven or paradise. We exactly. don't exactly know. Yeah. Oh, we don't exactly know. I, I was under the impression that he took the souls from Hades or Sheol to heaven. Right. And that everybody, Enoch and Elijah inclusive, have moved from Hades. Uh, I don't. Well, I don't think they they weren't in Hades. They were they were said to be in paradise. So. Exactly the relationship between paradise and heaven. I'm not. I'm not sure. It might be d dimensions. I don't know. We're not really told much about that. So there's basically a distinction between paradise and. Yeah, and because and the people who go to heaven have died, and Enoch and Elijah didn't gotcha, die. Gotcha, gotcha. All right. So how all that you. works, I don't know. Anyway, good questions. Yeah, good questions. Mario. What's up, Mario? Do 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 do. I'm mute. Hi, Jay. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you for having me on. I am actually a Roman Catholic, and but I'm trying to consider orthodoxy. And the main reason is not about all the discussions that you're regularly having about um, Filioque and the various theological issues, but my issues are more like uh, spiritual. So I wanted to ask you if you think that this could be a ground for conversion in the sense that if a person doesn't found, find any spiritual guide in the Catholic Church right now, whereas in Orthodoxy feels, I don't know, it can find more thriving parishes and stuff like, like this. And also if, it's your, if it's, it's your experience in the Orthodox Church when you came from Catholicism, if you too found, uh, I don't know, more guide in the spiritual life or... If you... um, I did, yeah. So you definitely will find typically more of that type of guidance. Um, I would just hesitate on thinking that that would be like the one thing that would tell you whether it's true or false, because at some point we do have to have uh, an analysis of the two different religious views in terms of their theology and their positions. So sometimes it's tempting and it may, maybe it feels daunting in terms of the theology. You think, oh, I don't want to get into all this. I don't have time. I'm just going to judge it on the basis of, um, you know, people choose, I think at times, bad indicators for which church they choose. For example, a lot of people chose Roman Catholicism in the last several years because they thought, oh, this is more politically based in trad. And then they yeah. end up five or six years later uh, miserable and angry and they feel like they made the wrong choice. So you can't make these decisions on things like, I, I'm not saying that that can't be one element. Like, you know, if you find a really good spiritual father, that might be one of the key things that helps you convert but anytime we pick like one of these things like that, that can be a little subjective. And I'm not saying that, the, that you're not going to find that, but 
Uh, for example, the two or three of the people who say we're looking at orthodoxy in the last five years that chose Rome, they would say things like what you're saying. They would say, oh, I met a, a trad cat priest who I felt gave me a better feeling about praying the rosary and how I felt when I prayed the rosary. I'm not saying you're saying that. I'm just using it as an example. They would have all of this terminology of how it made them feel and how the rosary made them feel. And I'm like, well, don't you see Mormons say that when you pray the Mormon prayer, you get the burning in your bosom and you feel good. So it's like, you can't use that as your final arbiter. I think you can have these indicators and intuitive sort of nudges, but we have to be very careful because Sometimes those inner feelings and, and what we think is intuition can also be deceptive. So at the end of the at the end of the day, it's got to come down to the positions, which one's consistent and which one contradicts. Otherwise, you're going to be constantly kind of, you know, maybe you after a year of orthodoxy and you don't feel like it's it's working or something. You, so then you're going to be, oh, I'm going to go to Roman Catholicism. And then two years in a row with I don't feel like it works anymore. So you just can't be basing it on feelings or things that are more subjective than things that are more objective. Okay. But what if, a, like, if a person is too thick? Is like, what? Too thick? Like T-H-I-C-C? Yeah. Like thick? <laughs> no, sorry. I'm Italian. Uh, if a person is too obtuse, too, like, I don't get, I simply can't figure it out. They're too complex for me. Certain topics about theology and stuff. Like, I imagine, like, a normal person in... A Catholic parish. I mean, you can't like, look at like Pachamama and see a problem with that. I know, but uh, a person can look at I don't know Lofton or someone else and find arguments on the other way. I don't know. We're not. Ta- that's a false equivalence. Michael Lofton is not the equivalent of the papacy. No, of course not. Right. So I'm just saying that there are no, no. But what other- I'm saying is a cleric engage in those kinds of actions without. Uh, basically committing the sin of apostasy and in roman catholic canon law apostasy means you're out of the church so like it's not it's not that difficult no but what i'm saying is that there are other smart dudes that say that's not apostasy or okay okay how could let me let, let's just put it this way uh, how do you call a crusade if you're urban the second and if you're benedict the 16th and pope francis you go and pray in the mosque towards mecca How are those two things not contradictions? You can't tell a contradiction. Um, I don't know. (laughs) That's the point. So what this points out, the, the point is that they don't have the worship of God there. How could you worship in a mosque towards Mecca? I mean, it's just, it's not even Christianity anymore. If you're doing that, some other religion. No, but one could say, well, that's on him, not on the whole. No, that's not how. No, that's not how that system works. Have you read Vatican One? Yes. Okay, what does it say? Does it say anything it about the? Does it say the, po- the protector of the, the guardian of the faith? Okay, and, and what's the sin? The okay, wait a minute. What's the sin of apostasy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I get, I get. No, you point. don't. But what is the sin of apostasy? It's when a person. Um, publicly renounce his faith or okay but else. you ha- but it's not just like you don't have to verbally say it i publicly renounce you can also signify that apostasy by your actions by your by your worship you don't think so yes i think it does okay do you think that muslims and christians worship the same god and so therefore it is okay to worship in a mosque i don't think it's okay to worship in a mosque, but I have my reserves on whether we worship the same God. Okay. Why would the Council of, I think, Vienne call them godless infidels if you worship the same God? Um, I don't know. Because infidels, okay, we can worship the same God and mm. call you infidel. No, you don't worship the same God as an infidel, by definition. And I'm pretty sure it's the Council of Vienna that calls Muslims infidels. Okay, I thought that infidel is like, you have the wrong faith. No, that's a heretic. That's a heretic, not an infidel. Okay. Okay, so do you think that um, an anti-Trinitarian and a Trinitarian have the same God? Could be, yeah. How could you have this? How could they be the same God? Then, so, so Arius and Nicaea were worshiping the same God? Um, I suppose they do, yeah. 
okay, so you haven't learned the basics, and I'm not trying to be mean to you, but your Roman Catholicism has not even taught you fundamental Christian theology. The no, Council of Nicaea I, excommunicates Arius. They don't worship the same God. That's crazy. I'm not saying you're crazy. I'm saying that's, that position is crazy. This is like Nicaea 101. How could Arius and, and, and the Council of Nicaea that excommunicates him worship the same God? Yeah, that's 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 also my point. I'm saying that. Okay, so you're not struggling. So you're struggling with Christianity. That's the point I'm getting at. This is actual Christianity. This is not which is the true church. You haven't come to understand that there's no such thing as everybody worshiping the same generic God. There's only the Trinity. That's the gospel. That's what Jesus preaches in the Book of John. Yeah. So no, and and the very fact that you think that the same God is being worshipped by Arius and Athanasius shows that you haven't understood the gospel yet. I'm not being mean, but this is a fact. You, th and this is why anybody I mean, with yeah. the discernment that we would have as Christians could look at going in a mosque and praying towards Mecca and say, this is not Christianity. This is some other, no, no. This is some other facsimile fraudulent religion. I mean, but that's a big leap from... No, it's not. You know... No, if you understand Christianity, it's not a leap at all. Do you think the Old Testament teaches a generic God, or does it teach the Trinity? The Gospels teaches the Trinity, of course. Oh, well, no, 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 the Old Testament, not the Gospels, the Old Testament. Oh, sorry, no, the Old Testament teaches the, the Trinity too. Oh, so how we is there? So where is this from the light of the Gospel? Where is this Aryan Unitarian God that we all worship? Then where's that coming from? It's not. It's an error of Ari and his followers. Okay, so it's then, error, so then you don't believe. Sorry, so you, then you don't believe Nostra Aetate's Vatican II document that Muslims and Roman Catholics and Jews all worship the same God. I wouldn't be Catholic if I told you that I don't believe in Nostra Aetate, of course. So yeah. So so well, those two things are mutually exclusive. Um, well, yeah. If you think that the Catholic has contradicted itself. Yeah, if you come to this conclusion, you can be Catholic. Well, I'm just saying the very conversation we're having, as you try to express faithfulness to Catholicism and Nostra Aetate, you're immediately confronted with the nonsensical position of trying to say that Arius and the Council of Nicaea are worshiping the same God. Okay, then why yeah. do we have a Council of Nicaea? What's the point of that? Why excommunicate uh, Eunomius and Arius? We're all worshiping the same God. Yeah, when you okay. talk to a, have you ever talked to a Jehovah's Witness? Um, yeah, slightly. Do you, do you deeply, does it but... does it appear in the midst of those conversations that you guys have the same theology about God? No, but I think that they actually don't believe in our same God. <laughs> do you? They have the same view as Arius. Okay, maybe no. Yeah, okay. So I then, so you, then Arius, so Arius and Athanasius don't worship the same God. I just thought that Arius thought that Christ um, came later, but was still like a, one with the same God. Whereas I think Jehovah's Witnesses no. think that they're actually two mm -hmm. different gods. No, they, they both that. teach that the uh, the Son of God is the first thing God created. Okay. Yeah, that's problematic. I wouldn't say... No, it's not problematic. It's, not it's, it's, it's a heresy. It's a different religion. Yeah, of course. Of course. Sure. Okay, so you, the, there's not the same deity being worshipped between uh, a Jehovah's Witness and a person who believes in the Trinity. Two different gods. Of course, of course. Then Nostra Aetate is not true. Because it not says God. that that Unitarians and Trinitarians all worship the same God. But are Jehovah's Witnesses Unitarians? I mean, yes, they are. Yes. But... <laughs> okay. okay. All right, I'm not trying to be mean, but... Um, you get the point. Good question. So I'm not I'm not downplaying your approach to looking for yeah, good spiritual know, guidance. Right. I think that's a healthy initial approach, but you gotta consider the other doctrinal things that we're talking about. So again, uh, great questions. Not being mean, just pointing out. I think what I think is the key issue here. So and I'm not. I, I, I enjoy chatting with you, Mario. Not not being mean to you. Not trying to be rude. Uh, Pantheon, what's up? It was actually a good question. Hey. Hi, Jay. How are you? Great. What's up? 
Good, big fan here in Europe. Um, just wanted to get two questions. One is the literal uh, understanding of the genesis. Uh, you said in one of your streams, I've been consuming your content, that the fall uh, kickstarted the uh, kickstarted entropy, so death in the universe in general. Uh, what I cannot get my mind around is that without entropy, uh, you cannot have time. Uh, any so entropy is a, is the a change in state of being. So even even the existence of the sun, you know, that burns helium to to to, to create uh, you know the to create heat. Uh, it's 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 such a natural part of the cosmos. Yeah. Well. That, okay. Can I, I can yeah. address this already? So yes. what what is being misunderstood here is the mode of nature before the fall and after the fall. So the assumption that is that from your physics sort of approach here is that the way that nature operates now is essentially the way that it worked in the Garden of Eden. And if you read uh, Genesis Creation, Early Man, or if you read books like First Form Man uh, by St. Simeon, the New Theologian, you'll realize that the premise or the presupposition of our view is that no, even the metaphysics of nature was different before the fall. So there was not entropy. And another reason for that is that the time as we experience it is also not identical to the aeon so there is a timeless eternity called that's created called the aeon and that's the realm in which the angels inhabit and so forth if you read Lossky's dogmatic theology there's a four-page section on the aeon i highly recommend that it's really good uh stan Eloy also goes into discussing the philosophy of time in orthodox dogmatics volume one in about 60 pages so those are good things to read on the philosophy of time when it comes to the orthodox position i also highly recommend mm -hmm. dr david bradshaw's paper uh time as a divine procession so no we don't have one uh reductionist idea of time as the mode of nature post fall um so two different notions okay. of time Okay, very well explained. We'll look at that. So I guess then the, the the age of the earth that we have in mind of the you know the ten thousand years, that's taken into account different sorts of uh, types of time passing before and after the fall. So, um, I don't think that young Earth creation necessarily relates to this point of of how time moves. So when when you know the scientists say you know Earth is two hundred fifty. Uh, million years old, and then we say no. What what is the basis for us to say no? Um, well, that gets into a whole other rabbit hole of like whether carbon dating is uh, legitimate, whether uh, ra radiation, whether light that comes from uh, you know distant galaxies t took a billion years to get here. I mean, th that's a whole other topic that. Um, I mean, I've written a few things criticizing that from a philosophical perspective. So, um, I mean, it's in other words, if God can create Adam uh, as a fully grown adult, then he can create a world that is already fully formed. So there's already a presupposition in this idea that somehow the light had to travel billions of years to get here or light years or whatever to get here. I mean, it's all just based on assumptions of uh, the long, you know, aeons of time theory but there's nothing about the the raw data that automatically tells you that it took giant aeons of time for that to be the case it's a presupposition so i don't i'm not a scientist i'm not an astronomer i can't tell you uh, all the science facts i can give you a philosophical critique of the presuppositions mm -hmm. of those positions though okay understood and can i get one more question please sure Okay, uh, I was just thinking that uh, you, you had said in one of your streams that the soul is created at inception or, you know, every, every soul is new when it comes to life. Just a thought experiment. Uh, if, if you're a parent and, you know, you, there is the probability that your child will be eternally damned and go to hell, um, why, why, why should someone who is Orthodox, who is Christian, uh, risk in having kids shouldn't shouldn't the solution to to humans problem you know let's let's all go to mount athos hit the monasteries uh, live an ascetic life and you know call it an end to the human experiment i, I know it's a bit uh, normy weird uh, thought experiment but i just want to hear your thoughts on this 
Uh, no, because uh, to be is better than to not be. I mean, um, if it was better to not be, then God would not have created the world at all. Uh, but as St. Maximus says, God created out of his own goodness. And so being flows forth, flows over uh, because God is good and being is good. So it's better to be than to not be. And um, it's better to have life and to potentially go to heaven than to not exist at all. So the dominion mandate of Genesis 1 still applies in that we are supposed to be fruitful and multiply. It's more important to be fruitful and multiply in a spiritual sense but the spiritual sense doesn't destroy or get rid of the natural sense. So a lot of uh, heresies, a lot of uh, um, Gnostic and mystic uh, sort of Zoroastrian or Manichaean type positions will, because the because in our view we think that the spiritual is more important than the temporal and the physical, they'll assume then that the temporal and physical is somehow evil and that we should get rid of it. And the same uh, line of reasoning goes that, oh, well, because... Um, spirituality is what matters, then uh, everything material is suddenly evil. And that's always a temptation, especially for people who choose ascetic life and monasticism. And that's, pr that's primarily the, the typical warning for monastics and, and those kinds of people is that they're usually tempted with a form of prelast or spiritual pride. So God's created a diverse group of, uh, of humans, and not everybody will have that life. Jesus specifically says that that's a gift for some people and not for everybody. So it doesn't make the production of children somehow uh, because it's a lesser. So a lot of people have this idea that a lesser good is therefore an evil. And that's actually a Neoplatonic uh, presupposition that, for example, Augustine has. Augustine says that if the value of singlehood is better than marriage, then marriage must contain some kind of necessary evil and that's a false dialectical thinking so so no we, we not everybody is called to um to live that life and to cease having offspring because god intends to populate to populate heaven i mean father deacon i don't know if you would speak to that because uh, you have more experience as clergy you know interacting with married people um married priests you know orthodox priests are married you know, if we had this attitude that this was the ideal, then we would have like a Roman Catholic, uh, you know, stricture on no priest being married or something like that. Uh, Father Deacon, would you want to speak to that question? Like, well, why aren't we all just, you know, spiritual, spiritual people on Athos being celibate and ceasing to have offspring? Isn't that truly spiritual? Yeah, I think you nailed it with the kind of Greek metaphysics that Augustine, uh, presupposes and embraces that there's one good yeah and that uh if you're not if you're not attempting um and contemplating that good and and praying then um it's an evil yeah and i it's not even quite clear in orthodox uh fathers that the celibate and monastic life is a higher. It might be for certain people in certain situations. Um, but yeah, that's uh, this question came up too. That should I, you know, watch secular movies or listen to secular music or something like that? With this idea of this kind of either or, that if you're not moving up the ladder and doing the highest things then you're falling away from God, which is a, a dialectic. Um, there isn't this... In ethics, it would be called the ontological status of something, um, of a moral, would be objective, but the category of absolute is has to do with the category of stringency. In other words, do morally objective rules um, apply always everywhere at the same degree for all people and yeah. that's clearly not that's it's a good not point. the case and so orthodoxy has a nuanced depends where you are who you are that's why you talk to your priest there's no hard and fast rule and we're not rule worshipers um secular music might be bad for one person at one level it's it's good you know insofar as something exists it's good so, you know, if it's not soul corrupting or something like that, 
there's nothing wrong and it's a it's a good it's an energy of god even in the secular world when a musician um or an artist produces something of beauty without you know being orthodox or something like that does that make sense yeah yeah no totally totally Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, that was a great question. Uh, Father Ding, where do you think this idea, I mean, it's kind of a Gnostic, iconoclastic idea that anything that isn't like immediately directly the, the quote, spiritual or religious is somehow like evil. It's got to be destroyed. It's got to be, I, mean, I think it's a lot of, um, I mean, I had this phase when I was a young evangelical where I felt like, oh, uh, I have a bunch of CDs and VHS movies and I thought that as an evangelical when I was like 19 that I had to throw it all away to show God that I was like really devoted and that I don't believe in anything secular. And But what I realized is that the problem isn't these externals. The problem was that I had an attachment to a lot of this goofy stuff that wasn't the thing itself. It was a disordered attachment. The, the, the attachment was in me, not in the, the objects themselves. And yeah, like Father Deacon said, I mean, some of those movies were probably, you know, of no aesthetic value or whatever, just like, I don't know, degenerate horror movies or something that I threw away. Or I, I had like a, I remember having like an H.R. Giger uh, poster at one point that I thought was really cool. And that's, you know, explicitly like a demonic thing that I was happy, I think, to get rid of. But beyond that kind of explicitly demonic stuff, I mean... The problem isn't the CDs and the the movie per se or the poster or it's the inner state that you have that you have an attachment to this to, to, and it could be to anything. I mean, anything can become one of these idols that we're attached yes. to and it yes. doesn't have to be a physical object. You can be attached to your heterodox idea that you worship somebody like Bryson Gray, who's wedded to this ridiculous Hebrew roots idea and he's so married to and wedded to this heterodox idea in his head and the pride that goes into that that that's an idol more of more of an idol than you know like perhaps even uh, you know your CDs or whatever well I was thinking like yeah. philosophy too yeah, philosophy is a great example yeah uh, all these people who I, I've noticed a trend among people who are anti presuppositionalists anti tag and they they've made an idol of the scholastic and academic uh, discipline of philosophy. Well, I'll just do this, and I'll make this system. And, it, and I'm starting to notice it's blinding people from certain obvious truths that should be obvious. And I think all idols do that. Yeah, exactly. They're a distraction from. Um, the truths of God. Yeah, I call it ideology. So ideology. That's, that's my term. But I think too, just the the kind of fallen is the man of wanting to get caught up in. Uh, I mean, being prone to dialectics. Right. I have to because I remember this growing up. God in good, therefore world bad. Right. Yeah, I, I must deny the world and everything in it. Um, which is interesting from the evangelical perspective because they say that, you know, they speak out of one side of their mouth saying that while they introduce ac actually so secular culture. Exactly. Into and the church. Their, their, their church and yeah. praise music. And, right. Um, there might be even two I've been thinking about the influence of the Puritans. Yeah, absolutely. I was thinking that too. Because they they were very like iconoclastic, yeah. In fact, when I was at a, a strict reform Presbyterian church, we would actually have conversations about um, whether uh, like fantasy books like Tolkien were or C.S. Lewis were sinful and violations of the law of God. Um, whether you could play a video game, was that a violation of the law of God? And the reasoning was that they're not real. And so some of the Protestants, uh, some of the Puritans in their theology treatises would argue that Anything that isn't, for example, a real painting is sin because it's depicting something that's not real. So it's therefore idolatry. So they got into almost like like Islamic level iconoclasm with trying to be you know these weird Puritans. And the other thing too that's interesting, my wife and I were talking about this last night. Do you know all the kind of rigid social and etiquette rules that the Puritans established? Yeah, 
Absolutely. Yeah, I was all into their theology at one point. Um, I mean, you talk about like a uh, sign of the the, the cult, a uh, uh, cult. Um, this kind of rigid, forced rule worshiping. Um, everything in your life's controlled. Um, you could be called up and excommunicated, or you know, in the uh, the civil wars um, with Cromwell and stuff like that. The sort of things that they were doing. Um, because of role worship, uh, it's quite fascinating. So I think we're influenced by that, whether we like it or not, and it's come in certainly in the United States. Um. So yeah, somebody in the chat is saying, uh, I don't know if to you or to me, he's saying, didn't the church fathers tell you to renounce everything? Didn't the church fathers tell you to... Uh, do the very thing that you're saying is isn't sinful. Oh, I've never seen it. <laughs> but it, I love these general kind of. Well, I think he's like he's talking about like monastic stuff. So in other words, well, what would you say to the monastics, Father Deacon Ananias? Because you're saying that that they're denying the world, and aren't they more holy than you? That seems to be the sentiment of the some of the people in the chat. What would you say to that? It's a it's a calling. Um, and the thing is, there's different levels of it. So clearly, and we can't all become monastics. I mean, there's just no way functionally that we could do that. So they've denied the world and they're no longer in the world either, but we're called to be deny the world, I think is... I think this gentleman is getting confused about particulars. It's a, isn't it a general mindset that I die to the world? I no longer think about the things in the world the way the, the secular mind does. That, I think, is what the fathers and scripture is calling us all to do, whether we're monastics or not, is it's about prioritization, the way that I see these various things. I've had a mentonia, a change of mind and the way that I approach these things. That's to put away the world. That doesn't mean that, oh, I have to become a monk or something like that. Well, the other thing, too, that people misunderstand, and it's very common, is that they think that to say that I'm denying the world, they think that it means like physicality and the objects in the world. Like they think that yeah. the things themselves are the problem. The purpose of asceticism is nothing to do with the things in the world as objects. It's you not being controlled by the objects and your passions yes. is, is the point. So when it says that, uh, you know, the, the, the world is under the power of Satan. Okay, it's not talking about physical objects. This is typical Gnostic sort of Protestant mm -hmm. misunderstanding. It's talking about the world system that is the spiritual reality of Satan and his kingdom against God. It is not saying that working as a judge or working as a policeman or working as a soldier, it means that you're evil because you're, quote, part of the world. This is all just total Gnostic misunderstanding that is very common to a lot of people that are new converts, to evangelicals, and to and it's a temptation, I think, for people uh, in monastic life, too. And I mean, to prove that, just read a lot of the monastic literature that's always warning the monks about the temptations to spiritual pride. Is that not correct? Yeah, absolutely. And I like that you point out the Gnostic aspect because if you remember when we were evangelicals, they would interpret um, things of the flesh. Yeah, exactly. As the body. To mean, yeah, physical, anything physical, anything material. When it was talking about... Um, the passions, basically. The passions and putting things in the wrong place and, and making idols and letting letting lower things rule the higher things. I mean, that's a good way to put it. Don't let your lower things rule yeah, your higher things. Exactly. That's that's the whole point, yeah. And, uh, yeah, letting... Uh, and remember, idolatry is primarily an issue of the inner man, the heart. It's not primarily an external thing. So Protestants also always think, for example, that Oh, when you kiss the icon, that's an action of idolatry. No, no, no. Idolatry is first and foremost 
comes out of the heart of man. Isn't this what Jesus says to the Pharisees? It's not what goes into the mouth. It's not the externals primarily that defile a man. It's what comes out of his heart. That's the point here. And for some people, the medicine might be different. So let's say you're, uh, let's say you're an 18 year old dude and you have been obsessed with, I don't know, some sort of weird music genre and your whole life is just wrapped up in, I don't know, some kind of weird music that you're all into. Okay. If that is an idol for you, it might be appropriate for you when you convert your spiritual father might say, it's time for you to take a break from this thing, which has a huge hold on your life. Maybe it's video games, right? Maybe video games is a better example. Maybe you spend eight hours a day playing video games. This is an idol to you. Your spiritual father is going to say, you need to start tapering off of and detaching from video games. Your first inclination is going to, think, to be to think video games are of the devil and they're evil. Satan created the video games. And I'm going to go online and I'm going to tweet out how everybody should uh, never play a video game. And if you do, you're violating the fast and you're sinning and I'm more pious than you. So now you're in a worse state. Literally, you're in a worst state because now you're a Pharisee and now you're publicly, performatively portraying your piety to the world, how you're not playing video games anymore. And the whole you're missing the entire point. The entire point is that you need healing and it might be appropriate for you for a time to fast from video games so that they're no longer having that idolatrous role in controlling your life and so forth. So that's the point. And the, it's the point, the problem isn't in the video games. The problem isn't in all the people outside of you. This is the father turbo quote, which you've already, yeah, multiple people in the chat have already pointed this out. When you become Orthodox before you're Orthodox, you're ready to solve all the problems of the world out there. Oh, I need to fix everyone else because everybody else is so bad. And then when you become Orthodox, you start realizing, oh, wait a minute. Uh, actually, the problem is in here. Are there problems out there? Yeah. But how are you going to solve all the problems out there before you start here? And starting here, this is another thing I want to rant real quick on. A lot of people I've noticed, young guys that convert. And Father Deacon, I want your opinion on this. I think Father Moses made this point too. There's a lot of young guys, I think, and I did this too when I was younger. It's a temptation to use spirituality and spiritual things as a way to shirk responsibilities. So rather than thinking about uh, how you're going to start a job or start a business, uh, what you're going to do in the future, saving money, learning about, you know, basic finance principles, this kind of stuff. Oh, uh, I'm a self-appointed Twitter monk and I don't have to worry with these worldly things. Meanwhile, you live at home and you're angry and you're mad and you don't have anything going on. And this spirituality is a cloak for lack of responsibility. Do you think that's a temptation for young guys too, which is, I think, a source of a lot of the anger that people are feeling? Yeah, absolutely. And notice the other thing too is that... Um, these people are prescribing their own medicine. Oh, interesting. Coming. Yeah. It's not coming from their priest to tell. They're prescribing where they need to be at, which is obviously a trap. And then something came up recently, too, that um, somebody had mentioned, you know, <clears throat> well, was in a chat um, earlier today that somebody said, um, Father Daniel, or St. Daniel, Father Daniel, you know, the martyr in Russia, said not to get um not to pay attention to conspiracy theories well it depends on what you mean by conspiracy theories um but it's good to know geopolitics and what's going on or there's nothing wrong with being politically involved because you're not a monk those things directly impact your family your finances um your neighbors your parish and so i've seen that temptation well, I don't get involved in politics. Uh, I don't vote. I don't. I don't pay attention to anything. I just read the prayers and stuff like that. Well, isn't that your point, Jay? That that's a great way to skirt responsibility. Isn't that nice that you don't do any of that stuff? Yeah, I think. Meanwhile, yeah. you'll find that like you invested in something you shouldn't have, or something happened, and now your family's desolate. Congratulations. Yeah, I think uh, Father Moses is making that point that you know. 
the temptation is, oh, I'm going to, um, you know, master canon law. I just convert. I'm a catechumen. I'm 19. I'm reading the canons. I'm going to tell the priests and the bishops where they're wrong. I'm going to do this and that. Um, but, you know, this person has no life experience, has never done anything, never dealt with like a real trauma or hardship in their life, uh, never built a business, has no wisdom, yet believes that they're in a position to act in that way. And I think your your point there is that it's a, could, could you just briefly expand on what you mean by um, prescribing their own medicine? Because we, we might have a lot of people that, that don't know what that means. So prayer life, reading the fathers, where you should be spiritually, um, from an orthodox point of view, that's medicine. Because Christ calls us to become more than what we are. I guarantee you nobody's spiritual father is telling them to go read uh, the rudder. That's right. Um, and so what they're doing is they're creating in their own mind that, well, I'm going to achieve these spiritual heights. I'm going to do yeah. these prayers. I'm going to read this. I'm going to negate these things in life. and But they're doing it by themselves. They're not even beyond just like talking to their priest. They're not even getting general counsel from yeah. friends or or family members or people that are wiser. Um, they're just they've decided um, what's going to be best for them, and they prescribe it. And it's always disastrous, isn't it? Yeah, I think that a lot of times you you weren't in here yet, but earlier we were talking about the couple people that, for example, um, we've known over the last say five or six years who um, either were Orthodox or came very close to Orthodoxy and decided, oh, I'm going to go to Rome. And in both cases I can think of, um, there was an incident where one of them said, oh, uh, uh, I prayed in, uh, the Rosary and I felt good. Yes. So and uh, when I prayed Orthodoxy, I, so it didn't make me feel good. So it's yeah, it was just like bad. Yeah, so, and, and these are, like, not the right things to make your decisions based on, is what I'm trying to say. The other thing, too, is that we just finished up virtue ethics in our uh, ethics class. And one thing that I realized is that people want shortcuts. Yes. They want to get the answer by looking up in the back of the book, in a textbook. And so... They want a hard and fast rule on that'll apply and guide them through all the difficulties in life. And they don't like the answer that you're not going to be able to achieve that. There is nothing in a book that's going to be a hard and fast rule that you can just read and study. Um, you have to be guided. You, you have to work hard with the help of a priest and you have to turn to people um, that have acquired the virtues and wisdom and are much more spiritually advanced than you to help you. Now, people don't like that. They want a papal bullet point list. Uh, I could just look in a textbook and it'll just tell me what to do in all these ethical situations. So I think it's the heart of it's both... Um, a spiritual laziness and then also pride. I can do it myself. I don't, I don't want to have to turn to somebody and entrust my life to a spiritual father or a priest. Um, I want to be able to argue my way through and figure this stuff all out by myself. And I want it all formulaic and hard and fast rules. And they end up being rule worshipers. Yeah, that's a great uh, point. And uh, your uh, insights on uh, virtue ethics, by the way, really good. I've been watching your lectures. I want to remind everybody, head on over to Patristic Faith, uh, which is Father Deacon's channel, and you'll notice that he has quite a few of his uh, ethics course lectures, which are which are uh, which are great because we uh, we we are basically virtue ethicists. So if you want to understand, well, what's the orthodox philosophy of ethics? Uh, Father Deacon's course is really good. Um, I've done, I think whatever however many you got two or three up i think i've watched two of them at least how many have you got up now hold on a second what'd you say how many of your courses are up i think i've watched two do you have three up yet oh on the ethics, ethics? yeah um no 
I'll put some more up. I've, I have them recording stuff. I just, I don't always live stream it in that, but I do have them recording. I can upload various ones. The last, the last virtue ethics we did, I thought was really good. Yeah, I watched it. It was really good. Yeah, that's what I was telling you. The one I haven't put up yet. That it, it, like oh, the, the one you have. Oh, okay. Of that's really good. Okay. I think I should upload that. Yeah, I, I, I've been w watching, and they're really good. And I'm telling everybody in the chat to go watch it. And Noah Thank M you. says for three dollars that he was baptized, brought in the church with this. What happens? We all get our paradigms reorienting. By the way, that paradigm reorienting process is not going to happen just one time. Uh, now, it may not happen like at a mega level, like when you you know the level of converting. But we're all going to have carryovers. We're all going to bring our baggage, and we have to remember that it takes a long time to, for a lot of that baggage to to get washed out. So, you know, we're going to be tempted when we become Orthodox. Oh, I need to bring uh, these evangelical things into Orthodoxy to help Orthodoxy. Oh, I need to make Orthodoxy Thomistic to save it. And this is a, a wrong approach. So don't be um, weirded out that you're going to continue to have kind of things you're going to struggle with. Big Boss, $16. You are mean and therefore uh, you're wrong. You are an accuser. Exactly. So that's the uh, fallacy ad menum there that i always engage in thank you big boss arena 25 dollars. god bless thank you so much arena appreciate that based pay piggy ten dollars can you do an impression of john uh hagee offering up blood moon pies to iran for peace this is john hagee i want to tell everybody this is fulfillment of a biblical prophecy when iran attacks it is of course because of the 13 blood moons that have appeared along with the signs of the aliens in the sky if we could only offer up 14 blood moon pies to israel for, to Iran for peace. We would have the return of Messiah. So how's that? Uh, store 96, $10. Thank you so much, Store. I wasn't expecting to do a John Hagee, so it was a, little, it was a little rough there. I apologize. Marinkus Man, $3. What does it mean to fill up what is lacking, lacking in the suffering of Christ? Um, I think Paul is saying that just as Christ went through a measure of suffering in his, um, in his flesh, in his body, throughout his life, and particularly, of course, in the crucifixion, death, uh, and descent into Hades, that we will also, as the body, experience a same measure of suffering. So Paul is basically saying that God has in his providence for, for his, St. Paul's life, um, an appointed uh, suffering, martyrdom, and then death that he would undergo, and that would, quote, fill up what was lacking in in the sense of the body of Christ, the people also going through what Christ went through because we're mystically united to him. It doesn't mean that Christ's sacrifice itself was lacking. It just means that his body would also then also would, would also then in history go through uh, the gates of death. What St. Saint Athanasius says that the cross has turned the gate of death into the gate of life. Cataclysm, $5. Calvin was a collector of heresies. Uh, I would agree with that. He accepts the eunomian premise and says that the son is autotheos. That is correct. <clears throat> now, some Calvinists will try to argue that he qualified this later on. Yeah, whatever. Um, back in my right mind, 88, $5. This is some Orthodox love from an Orthodox grandmother. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. That's sweet. Uh, X, $5. This is to probably to Father Deacon. Um, tag entails supplemental arguments. <clears throat> And it has proposition one as its conclusion could be made. I don't know what that sentence means. It is an attempt that begs the question. All other worldviews can account for knowledge, so the first one is true. Give the non-fallacious argument for tag. So this is the same thing that J. Mike uh, puts in the chat every time. And uh, we just did a stream with Father Deacon about his new paper that he wrote addressing this very argument. So, Father Deacon, would you have any comments on a kind of the the rundown that we just did on the live stream a few days ago, the objection to tag that uh, it's not logically demonstrating that all the other worldviews are false, and it assumes the thing that it's arguing in its first premise, and that, uh, I don't even remember what the other, what was the other things they say? Um... I'll just go through and probably address. So I think it was a mistake in understanding what generally in principle a transcendental deduction is. Yes. And, and oh, that's right. Because we, uh, we were talking about um, uh, meta level arguments and what that is. Yeah. So this gentleman was saying that it assumes 
what you want to prove. But if you read the definition, just generally what how Kant lays it out, it's something that's not the conclusion of a deduction, but must be assumed in order transcendentally deduced such that experience um, and knowledge and these predicates uh, to be considered true about the world um, would be possible. So you can't say that a transcendental uh, argument in general is question begging. Now you might say, well, I don't see how uh, orthodoxy the god of orthodoxy satisfies that condition which is a legitimate question which goes to again well that's why there are supplemental arguments in the sense of again showing by the impossibility of the contrary that all world views boil into either revelatory theism or autonomous epistemology and the problems that autonomous epistemology could not give an account for knowledge or say that knowledge exists um and ultimately this goes back to the radical disjunctive between there's only two possible positions um either accidentalism or purposeful intentionalism so that would be a you know accidentalism would be a defeater for knowledge so we can show how orthodoxy is the only thing that actually satisfies it, which is the strongest sort of argument. Um, yeah. Now, a lot of people are asking, where is this paper that we covered in this live stream? They want to read your paper. Is there a place where right. it's easy, easily accessible? Yeah. I'll put it in the chat. It's, okay. Um, all my, I think almost all my papers Academia. are Edu. in academia.edu, okay. so I'll put that in the chat. Okay. Also, I find it ironic... Um, how can somebody say an argument works or doesn't work or begs the question if they can't actually justify uh, the normativity yeah. and legitimacy of uh, principles of logic exactly. and economic principles? And so, so yeah, we, we went into that in that live stream. So I would say watch the live stream we just did as well because you made that point multiple times. It was really good. Okay, next up is uh, a person who wanted to come into debate earlier, Theoden of Rohan. So we're going to bring him up next. All right, what's up? You got to unmute. Hey, Jamie. Yo, Jamie. Could you make me a double shot? Hello, am I on? You are. What's up, man? Wow, is my sound good? Yeah, did you hop off of your noble steed, Theoden? Oh, I don't have one. It's just a LARP. I didn't literally think you were Theoden of Rohan, so... Okay. So, I would like to talk about evolution. Uh, I would. I will talk about it in a philosophical sense. Is that what you want to get into? And no, I, I was actually heading for the more biological... I mean, I'm not. I'm not trained in that, so I can't really address it. Okay. And uh, it relates to a lot of other stuff. If I take too long, we can take a break and maybe come on later. Because it relates to a lot of stuff about anthropology, like what is the dividing line between humans and animals? And yeah. how to reconcile evolution with genesis. Mm. Do, you, do you have a philosophy of science perspective? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by that. Oh, so you never heard of this discipline called philosophy of science? I've heard of it, but so I am uh, I am a Christian and right winger. So, and I've listened to your past stuff about evolution, and most of the time I noticed that you're on the on the philosophical lane. You um, conflate it with em pure empiricism. And I can wait. Hold on. You think I can? You think I conflate evolution with empiricism? Like I don't know the difference between those two things. No, no, no. Um, I, I don't want to uh, be negative about it. I just noticed that uh, whenever you talked about evolution, Darwinian evolution in the past, it was more, it, the argument got distracted about empiricism, materialism. I like see, I see, I see what you're saying. Worldview. Right, well, most, but most people from that perspective have that presupposition. So you're correct that 
there are theistic evolutionists who would not be subject to all those criticisms. But that that video, the old videos addressing Darwinism were mainly directed at, at atheists, not theistic evolutionists. So, um, so now when you say you're a theistic Christian or a, a Christian evolutionary proponent, can I ask you what theological tradition you, you mean you're coming from? Um, I'm kind of uh, wishy-washy, slow by complicated at the moment. I used to be an agnostic materialist up until two years ago. And for the last two years, I've been just learning and discerning and still so. And I'm okay. a baptized Catholic, so I'm, I'm uh, Timothy Gordon and yourself, Jay Daya, are my two favorites. So I, I'm very glad and encouraged that dialogue. And I happen to go to an SSPX at the moment, but I'm not. I don't have my ego attached or I'm aggressive about it. It's just yeah. I think yeah, so, that's fair. And I'm I'm not trying to be a douchebag. I don't. I'm just. I typically I know my wheelhouses, uh, and I'm not studied in biology. I do believe that there's such a thing as natural selection. I do believe that we have the ability within us to adapt, uh, which I think God put there. Uh, but I don't think any of that justifies macro transmutation of species. So, and I've heard a million times what people think is the argument for, uh, if you give it enough time, uh, you know, the minor adaptations will eventually produce something else. I don't find any of those arguments to be convincing. So I stick to my wheelhouse, which is philosophy of science. That's what I studied quite a bit in undergrad. So if you want to uh, address that stuff, I can address it. We could have that debate. But when it comes to biology, I'll just concede to you. I don't. I don't know enough about biology. Okay. Yeah. The, the last, like a couple of weeks ago, another guy called in about evolution, and you basically gave him that same answer that you had. Well, I mean, what what do you expect of me to? Am I supposed so? Am I failing you here because I don't know a whole discipline? Of, I mean, humans only have enough time. I mean, I try my best to master geopolitical stuff, history, you know, I mean, I can't learn everything. So what, what, I mean, here, let me put the argument this way. I mean, do you think that biology and, and the science that you do, and I'm not knocking it, do you think that it relies on any like philosophy of science? Yeah, sure. Okay. How do you know that you have the right starting points for philosophy of science? I mean, maybe you do, I'm not saying you don't, but how would you know if you do? Well, I concede to you on, on philosophical grounds. That's, okay, fair enough. And I, I, your point is totally cool. Um, so, but uh, on the bio the uh, statements I've heard from you on the biological aspects of evolution, I could respond to those. And I also I have my half baked, maybe heretical way of reconciling Genesis with evolution, and it relates to. Uh, just well, one. Uh, okay. One, uh, let's just question. put it. Let's just put it this way, though. Like. Even if you have a, a you know a theory and all that, and I'm not saying you don't. Like I think the main issue will be if you want a historic version of Christianity, whether Orthodox or Roman Catholic. Um, the Six Ecumenical Council has a very strict, clear statement about there not being death before the fall. So the the challenge I think will be there uh, for your type of position. Now I know that Roman Catholicism is much more amenable in terms of. Um, you know, Pius the Twelfth encyclical about uh, theistic evolution. So, you, if, if this is like the linchpin thing for you, then you might be leaning towards Roman Catholicism over something like that. I don't think Orthodoxy has explicit statements like um, you have to affirm six day creation. It's more so that this is pretty much the the view everywhere. I mean, you, you really have to look hard to find even something that's not that like with with uh, Saint Augustine. But nobody holds Augustine's view because he believed in instantaneous creation. So Augustine is not any way a like help for the evolution proponents or the people who don't believe in six day creation. So I think ultimately it just comes down to like our presuppositions and um, anyway. So I, was I, I don't know. Add Go ahead. To that I think both historically and philosophically. Uh, Evolution, uh, in the sense of macroevolution, is predicated upon uh, nominalism. And because if you think about, once you have nominalism, which is a rejection of real essentialism, uh, real like essences that define what species are, and 
going back to Aristotle, uh, species, there's what he calls the fixity of species. Yeah, exactly. So both historically what happens, and then I think what's necessary philosophically in order to say species can change into other, evolve into other species, is you have to blur the distinction. You have to break that kind of and reject the real centralism so that you can say blur the distinctions and say well look see here a species could change into another species all of which is to say and certainly modern biology has embraced a nominalistic and a rejection of teleology and real essentialism within biology that allows them the kind of philosophical hardware to attempt to make the case for evolution that species can change into other species and I think that's important to, to identify that presupposition. Anyway, I'm sorry this wasn't kind of the thing that you wanted, Theoden, but uh, uh, we're going to move on to, let's see, next up is uh, a person who I'm assuming probably wants to talk about seven-day Adventist stuff. What's up? You can unmute. Chase, you want to unmute? Which Chase? This Chase? Mm-hmm. Yes, sir, I do. It's an honor to talk to you. I really appreciate you, Jay. Well, you don't really, but that's okay. No, I really do. I respect your diligence and you, uh, your work. I respect your work ethic. Um, I just have some <laughs> questions like, uh, maybe two. I put a few I've written. I don't know if you've seen any that I wrote. Uh, I saw that you made a lot of videos. I didn't watch the videos. Oh, okay. Well, that's that's cool. Um, so a couple questions would be like, I know that you you'll say like, I think in Thessalonica or I forget where it is. There's iconography in the churches. The Dura Europa Syn- Dura Europa Synagogue. Okay, um, you're, you're saying the synagogue. I was thinking of some early churches that you were talking about. But well, there are okay. there are early churches that have that, but most of the time we make the argument that you can see uh, early, you know, contemporary with Christian synagogues in second, third century that have iconography. All right. So then my point would be, Paul says, um, I mean, maybe maybe three points here. If and they're they're quick. Um, so Paul says the mystery of lawlessness, I mean, it's translated iniquity, is already at work, first century. And so doesn't this prove a trend of apostasy away from the jot and tittle view? Okay, can we, let's take them one at a time. So my response to that would be, it doesn't follow from the fact that Paul's saying that, that the things that you're identifying as apostasy, such as imagery, is what Paul's talking about. Well, let's not let's not connect that. No, but that doesn't. We don't have to connect those. That's fine. Uh, you, but that doesn't. We don't have to get into that. I'm just just as a general principle, he's saying because it's translated sometimes as iniquity, but I'm saying it's also translated in some places as lawlessness. So he's saying the the mystery of iniquity or lawlessness is already at work, and so. If what I would say is it's a, the mystery in some sense is that it's a law, and I, I maybe try to find some consensus. Could you agree that there is a law, at least among Jews, that enforced lawlessness? Would you agree to that? That there was a, among first century Judaism, there was actually to them they called it law. That it that if you obeyed it, they, it mandated in certain ways that you would break God's law. Could we agree on that? Do you mean like a state law that would break God's law or a divine law? Well, no, it, it was Matthew 15. You know this, and I've heard you. Traditions of the elders, uh, oral Torah, and Talmud. is When it was written down, it was called Talmud. At the time, it was it was patristic tradition of first century Judaism was the law. What I'm saying is a law of lawlessness. It's literally a law that mandates that men break with the law of God. But could, could you agree with that? I mean, it was called tradition. Just but make the, the argument that where are you going with this argument that icons are the mystery of lawlessness? No, or, no, don't, or don't, the, even, the, don't, the, don't even go. 
the Sunday the worship. Right the Sunday worship is the breaking of the law. That is the mystery of lawless. So first of all, do you think that the temple had icons in it? I, I'm not even going there. I'm just okay. trying to find a consensus of definition of could we agree that there was what the Jews called the whole like they even to this day like you could go and see a Jewish authorities they call it if you say the whole law of Moses. You're thinking, oh, the written text. And they say, no, the written text is subsidiary and secondary, and the oral Torah is I'm primary. aware of that. Correct, yes. So they're actually saying, if you were to go to a lecture, uh, the oral portion it would be what the, the Talmud is, and then the, the index cards or notes, if you go to the lectern, the index, those little note cards, that's the written text. So to them, the primacy um, is on the... I, I, oral yes, tradition. I understand that. Yes. Okay. So when we get to Dositheus, he ends up saying what I'm what I'm simply saying is there's an analog that that is troublesome to me is that in the Song of Solomon the rabbis say there's a verse that says thy tongue is that thy mouth is sweeter than wine and they say that this is the the oral Torah from the readings of the rabbis is sweeter and more authoritative than the written text. Okay, we don't make the argument that the Song of Solomon is talking about patristic oral tradition, so... No, 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 I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm trying to find a consensus. I'm saying that the rabbis in first century Judaism, the battle that was going, I'm trying to establish what was the first century battle. And the first century battle was with this law of lawlessness that literally mandated men to break God's law but it was tradition and it was patristic tradition it was first century patristic tradition that was the traditional enemy of the apostolic faith no i think that That's makes you, that makes you a loon you what is what is so then what it's all you know, based on your faulty presupposition as to what you think the mystery of lawlessness is so your argument is built on something that it's not because that's well, your presupposition I'm, to prove your seven day okay, well, adventism Okay. Okay. So don't. But okay. Don't call it the mystery of all. Where do you get then. the Where do you get the canonical text that you're using to attack the church from? I'm I'm not going there. I'm just trying to know, find. Right. A consensus but I'm asking agreement. you to go there. Well, first, first and foremost, I take the view that uh, recognizing and compiling a inspired text is not proof of interpreting it and the reason i would say that okay, is when Peter, but when was it recognized and and collected okay let, can, can i i know that you're going to say it wasn't for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years later but okay I, I know and you think it, okay you think that it's not that so when was it where's your proof of that well my point would be that, that this and the sovereign prerogative of god he in his own sovereign prerogative didn't upload it all at once and in his so begging the question like, so there's not an actual historical no, account of what you're saying I don't, I don't necessarily believe i don't believe that that's because like when the new testament came out certain cities were getting revelation before other cities and everybody wasn't having it all so, at once and what i'm saying is it wasn't god's will when ephesus had a, a church dispute or, or corinth okay, so how is corinth this addressing got, the the, compo the canon where's the canon when does it come to be? Uh, there didn't need to, what I'm saying is is that, that that's not how it was it wasn't God's prerogative. Mm. I'm not even sure that that's what God was concerned about having mm. a whole compiled text. Like that's subsidiary. I'm talking and that's not so even So would my that point. be because as a Seventh Day Adventist you believe in Ellen White's uh, ongoing charismatic revelation is that why? I'm not a Seventh Day I'm not a Seventh Day Adventist. I simply believe that there is a based on based on Paul after the resurrection twice Acts chapter 21 uh, and, and 22, he says, I am a Jew. Jesus says salvation is of the Jews, John 4, 22. So? Uh, Romans 2, he's talking about Gentiles. He's saying he is a Jew who is one inwardly a Jew. And then in Yeah, that means a Christian. It, he doesn't say Christian. That's, That's what it means. Idea. The spiritual Israel in Galatians, at the end of Galatians, is the church of Galatia. Okay, so what I would say is, before all that, in Romans, sorry, uh, Jeremiah Hold 31. Hold on, what is your position? So, you're not going to get the right to say all this stuff and not disclose oh, what your position is. My pos my position is that is that there is something called way or Nazarene um, Judaism, and that what Jesus is battling over in the first century is who... Oh, so you're a Messianic Jew, is that right? 
you you could call it that, but my argument would be that the word that's a redundancy in the sense that Judaism, why Judah? And it's because of Micah 5 2. Behold, Bethlehem, Ephrata, out of you will come forth from me a ruler over all Israel. Are you anti Trinitarian or not? No, I'm not anti Trinitarian. Okay, so you're Trinitarian. I, 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 I definitely believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All the mechanics of it, it it's, it, I'm not going to, I wouldn't get into all that. I would say that. Well, why, why, why don't you get into that? What do you mean? Because I, you don't, if, if, if that was, net, all I know is, is God can manifest as a, a burning bush, okay? Like, God can, you know, God can manifest, and to me, like, that was a burning so is, bush is dead. Is Jesus the eternal, is Jesus, Jesus the eternal son of God, or is he a creature? I'm, I'm not Arian. I, there, I could, there was, he never did not exist. He always did exist. Mm-hmm. Okay, you know, I mean, I'm not going to be Arian. I like Constantine. So the, so, so, the, so the group that put the Bible together was the apostate mystery of lawlessness people, right? I'm not, I'm not, look, all I'm going to say is that, because I've, I've read, you went through your article too on uh, church tradition. Okay. Tradition and church and mm-hmm. church history. Mm-hmm. Um, is is your final I, authority the scriptures? What's your final authority? This The spirit. What is that? The, the Holy Spirit, without that, um, it, the, the, the scriptures are dead ink, ink on paper. Okay. How, ink do on we paper adjudi- okay. How do we adjudicate between a bunch of different groups claiming to be led by the Spirit? All, here, okay, so, so, and I get that, but there's s- some sort of issues that I would have with, the, for instance, the, uh, the oral, would you agree? Did Jesus, that you're not a, answering, you're asking a two quote question. Did Jesus no, no, give, you just asked me, I asked you a question and you asked me a question. That's two quote question. Okay, so, I'm, I'm asking you to clarify where we're going. Would you agree that what did you're Je- Let me put it this way. Did Jesus leave the church any way to adjudicate between all the different heretics who claim to be led by the Spirit? Um, I believe it existed in the apostles. How, and, between you and I, if we both believe that we're led by the Spirit, which is the thing that you appeal to as your final thing, how do we adjudicate between these two things? Because you said it's not the dead letter that's the final, te- it's not the Bible. Technically, well, technically, you, you, the, the church is, according to 1 Corinthians 6, supposed to act as a bait dean, which is a house of judgment. And Paul's standard is, is so, there not a wise So the standard is what? Your, your sect? That's the standard we go to your... No, I'm going, I'm going to, I believe in the church, but all I'm, all I'm saying, brother, what is church? that from like... Where? The, the collective, the, the body of believers everywhere. Where is that? Well, you think we're part of the mystery of lawlessness, so this is your no, messianic I sect. Your, I don't so your messianic I don't sect is re, is led by the Spirit. I'm sure, right? I know. So no, I, where I, do we I, adjudicate? I say, no, I hey, I bro, I value you. I appreciate you. I I I'm, yeah, I learn from right. you. I, I'm not I'm no. not sitting here saying I don't care about you. Yeah, that's but why you've got like 30 videos calling me out. That's a bunch of baloney. All right, this is not going anywhere, so we're going to move on. The architect, what's up? So I'm never going to get an answer as to what adjudicates between two people claiming to be led by the Spirit. My point then being that Jesus didn't even give to the church a mechanism to judge between a thousand different loons claiming to be led by the Spirit. Did he not foresee that there would be... It seems like he did foresee that there would be some problems. And it seems like he said that the church would not fail and that the mystery of lawlessness would not be controlling the church since the first century so no i don't think the mystery of lawlessness is what you think that it is um go ahead architect hey what's up how you doing good what's up man hey so i wanted to talk about the tag and so what i specifically wanted to ask i know you touched on this a little bit earlier but i wanted you to expound upon it but this idea that only the christian worldview has the necessary uh, conceptual machinery to account for universals, right? So It's not just for universals. It's for all of the transcendental categories. Right, right. But that's specifically what comes to mind. Um, But so, yeah, I know you've talked specifically about a divine mind, right? But that's also compatible, you know, with views like Neoplatonism. But what specifically... Yeah, and that's why we go into pointing out how Neoplatonism doesn't do that work because of the fundamental problems in Neoplatonism. Right. So, but I'm specifically interested in what you mentioned earlier about the Christian view of history, right? The Christian philosophy of history. So, yeah, I'm just curious for you to expound a little bit upon that and emphasize how specifically that view of history 
contribute to the ability of the Christian worldview to account well, for these. Well, earlier I was addressing the argument that what if somebody said that I have all of your same metaphysics, but it's like, I don't know, some new made up uh, like pagan or say a Wotan trinity. What if I posited a deity that had all of your same metaphysics? And I was saying that it wouldn't work because number one, our view is not just a thing you can sort of make up on the spot. It's intimately tied to history and the revelation of the, of the Christian message through the person of Christ. And that's unique because you don't get um, what we have as a, as a historical revelation in quite a few religions. Some religions are pro-history, but many religions are ahistorical or anti-time and space. And so they would actually be, you know, something like, I don't know, Buddhism or something like that, where you sort of need to transcend this world or this dimension, this reality, or some form of Gnosticism that's anti this world. So what I was just saying is that, number one, the position would be inauthentic because it wouldn't be giving an account for history to just pause it on the spot, a new made up uh, sort of deity. And it also wouldn't work because it's obviously cribbing from an earlier existing Christian position. Right, but regarding history, what you just said about cribbing from the Christian position, is that not a separate question, right? So if we're specifically talking about accounting for transcendental categories... And this no, if, he, if, his, if his ultimate principle is something that's obviously just borrowed from our position, that wouldn't work. Why not? Because it's obviously borrowed from our position. I mean, well, the, well, the specific question I'm asking is why does that make it false, right? So if they account for... Because it's fraudulent. Specific... It would be a facsimile. Wait. Oh, I'm not sorry. I'm not sure what you mean by that. You don't know what the words fraudulent and facsimile of a previous existing position would be? I guess I'm just confused as to why specifically this is relevant. So if we're trying to account for this specific because it's question, not right? Because the position has to be not just a metaphysical abstraction. Our position also says that God steps into time and space. And so if his position is ripping off our position, because that was the example that the atheist or the, the, the person gave, it would not be our position because our position identifies Christ as the person of history. So how could you identify Christ as a person in history in a facsimile position that you've made up? It would be, it would not be, it would be our position. And furthermore, in the, in our position claims that it's uniquely so. Um, that is a, a ex exclusionary. Um, and so it's self-defeating to say that you could just copy and abstract a, the theory when part of the theory yes. is exactly. not only that it matches uh, the history, uh, the ob i.e. fits the observation, but that it's exclusive. So this would say... It'd have to say it's both exclusive and not exclusive because I have the ability to rip off the same theory. In other words, part of the, the orthodox paradigm, it says um, not B. In other words, orthodox theory A says not B. So if, you rip, if you're B and you rip off orthodox theory A, you're saying B and not B, which is a contradiction. It's self-defeating. Yep. Well... What I'm specifically asking is if somebody were to adopt specific parts of the Orthodox Christian machinery, right? But so the argument, uh, uh, no, the argument was for the holistic paradigm, not picking and choosing. Uh, I'm not trying to be rude to you, but I want to get through more people because I'm gonna have to go be on Patrick Henningsen's show here in a moment. Uh, in about 15 minutes, uh, I'll be on his show uh, over on TNT, and we'll be discussing actually uh, Black Hebrew Israelites, weird cults and uh, how they might be being used uh, by the establishment. So we'll try to get through these quick between the between something. I can't see the rest of it. Between something. What's up, man? I didn't realize it was 450, so I'm going to have to go really soon. But Go ahead. I'm you. Hey, how's it going? Yes, I'll, sir. Try to, I'll try to hurry the best I can. Sure. Uh, I've had difficulty finding a satisfactory answer for this. Uh, it seems to me that when Paul sets the qualifications for elders in Titus and in Timothy, uh, that he includes a list of qualifications for elders and for those who oversee the church. That includes things like the ability to teach, uh, not being prone to anger. Uh, obviously, they can't be greedy so that they'll steal from the church and so forth. And among these qualifications is the fact that an elder is supposed to be the husband of a first or of one wife. 
and also that he's supposed to have children, that these children should be in subjection, and that they also be our believing children. Now, I know that in uh, Eastern Orthodoxy, a married man can become a priest, mm -hmm. if I understand correctly. But once he has taken his holy order, so to speak, he's not permitted to be married. Uh, I also, uh, if that's the case, it also means he cannot be married and also become a priest or a leader inside the church. This seems a violation of the scripture where it's clearly laid out. Um, not only is he unmarried, but he also doesn't have children, and also they're not believing children. Uh, this is uh, given to us uh, to describe uh, how we're to know whether or not he's worthy of the position. Because we can look at the way that he, he runs his uh, family and say to ourselves, yes, he treats his wife a certain way. Yes, his children are believers. Yes, they're in subjection. Therefore, this person can serve the church. Uh, I know that Catholic, uh, Roman Catholicism, I'm getting to my question. I know that Roman Catholicism, uh, in this case, requires you to be celibate. I know it's not the case for Eastern Orthodoxy, but allowing in Eastern Orthodoxy a priest to be unmarried and enter the position uh, seems a violation of the scriptures. Uh, what is the, 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 as I say, the rationality uh, for being able to pull this one verse out of its context and to ignore it? Mm. Devastating, dude. You got us. Father Deegan, would you want to speak to that? Yeah, so I think the first mistake is that to read everything uh, in Scripture in the same way, this is uh, kind of the problems that uh, uh, Judaizers have, um, that you have to keep the Torah, that all laws or all prescriptions or everything recorded in uh, Scripture um, are always applied everywhere at all times in all ways. And obviously, we see that certain prescriptions and commands were given uh, to God's people for particular reasons at particular times. That doesn't mean that there's this kind of eternal Quran and rule in the heavens. Yeah, the Protestant reads re the Protestant reads everything that Paul ever lists as an eternal law, and that there's no such thing as economia. And Jesus knew that the church would encounter different challenges at different times and in different places. So there has to be some flexibility in praxis when it comes to how these things work in history. And the reason for bishops not having families is because the duties of bishops in the ancient world got to be so um, difficult that it was not possible for them in the ancient world to travel with a family everywhere and so it became easier to draw the bishops from the monasteries so the church faced a real politic because this guy has in his profile that he deals with real politic the church faced this real politic where they had to deal with a historical reality and that's what they found to be a better practical scenario so could theoretically a bishop be married sure that's happened i'm sure in the history of the church there's no ironclad law that that couldn't happen but the mistake that he's making is to think that every qualification or everything that's done uh, in even in the Pauline period is a necessarily an eternal law. It's a great point, Father Deacon. I appreciate that. Um, I, I want to. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. That this is another example of kind of rule worship um, that and a misunderstanding of what the purpose of law is. Um, this is why in both Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, they don't have this kind of principle of economia. Right. Because they're legalistic uh, rule worshippers, that the law has to be absolutely applied everywhere at all times. It's this eternal kind of platonic, um, very Muslim kind of understanding Absolutely. of what law is. And um, But it's not. The law has a teleological end and purpose in which it's applied. And also, I think the mistake, too, is it sets scripture over and above the church um, rather than in synergy and part of the church is that yeah paul the says the, the yeah the church, the pillar and ground of, of truth is the church not written text the church interprets and applies the written text this is why there's such a thing as canon law are right, we going to move quick here isaac what's up isaac got to unmute i guess he dropped off sapphire Uh, what? I can't hear you, man. Go ahead. I think you got the wrong guy. I'm not Isaac. I'm. I'm no, he dropped off, and then I said Sapphire. Oh, okay. My bad. All right. Uh, I have a very short question. It's, okay. It, it's not very serious, but aliens are they fake or 
are they demons or is they're fake they and gay and they're also demons so how's that um let's see thomas what's up thomas guys remember to get tickets to our vegas event we'll be live in vegas with jamie kennedy it's a six hour event of uh unashamed infotainment comedy conspiracy deep geopolitical analysis esoterica and stand up all at one event in six hours june 22nd in las vegas get your tickets right there it's going to be a blast uh, also isaac vaishap will be joining us too because he's not too far from that region so get your tickets right there the link is in the show description and the link is in the chat what's up man thomas are you there can you hear me yes sir how are we doing um Great. i'd just like to say thank you jay for uh, your uh, apologetics for orthodoxy so i'm um uh, an anglican ordinand currently um but it's very much looking like i'm going to convert to orthodoxy and pursue the priesthood Oh, with cool. the, the Antiochian Orthodox Church in the UK, so good to hear. Yeah, you're, you're watching your stuff for the last few months, and it's just really, really helped a lot. Awesome. Um, I don't know other people in this country who have also been led by your you know, discussions and your writings and stuff. So, um, okay. yeah, the more stream you could do at these kind of times, so that people in Europe and the UK and stuff can get involved, and okay. yeah, it'd just be great. All right. Would well, you have so a question? That was, that was pretty much it. Really. Oh, okay. Well, um, thank you, man. Appreciate it. Nothing particularly, but yeah. All thanks right. a lot for your help. Thank you. Glad to hear about uh, heading in that direction. Happy Fortune. What's up, Happy Fortune? You rock Happy Fortune. Open cookie. Happy Fortune. Open cookie. Unmute. Rollstake $10 says, If Protestants try to use Orthodox arguments against Roman Catholics, why do they do that if they pick and choose the parts of ecumenical councils well i imagine that answers your question right there they're picking and choosing the parts that might help the protestant case they don't have a notion of normative authority exactly and that was kind of the point that i was getting into with the the guy that was um um messianic judaism or whatever noah m five dollar do you consider the Phocian council of 869 and the palamite synods to be quote ecumenical councils um it doesn't matter what you call them ec ecumenical councils um they're just authoritative pan-orthodox synods some people say that it doesn't teach any new dogmas well i mean there's no rule that like a council has to quote teach a quote new dogma that sounds like a that's like a roman catholic argument where they say that oh vatican ii doesn't count because it quote didn't teach new dogmas um yeah i mean the the palamite synods are accepted in the orthodox world they are referred to in the sense that we just had St. Gregory Palamas Sunday in the Lenten cycle a few Sundays ago. So uh, whether you call them, quote, ecumenical or pan-Orthodox synods or just accepted Orthodox synods, it doesn't matter because they're, they're our teaching. Absolutely. Honeybee, $100. Wow, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Kind of winning the Super Chat race tonight. Maya McSherry, $3. Are you going to debate Cosmic Skeptic? Uh, if you took him down, the low tier TikTok atheists would crumble on t uh, in their culture. Yeah. So the thing with that is that I've reached out multiple times. I've tweeted at him. I don't know how many times. Um, I think one time I tweeted at him and it got like Mohammed Hijab. It got hundreds of likes and shares. Um, same with Ben Shapiro. I don't think those people have any motivation to want to interact with me. I mean, they don't stand to gain anything by that interaction. So, I mean, I can keep trying, but... Uh, I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. L L two A five dollars. Have you brushed up on any Steve Quayle impressions? Um, I haven't thought about Steve Quayle in a long time. So, so when I did the last Steve Quayle impression, we're going to open up the portals for the Anunnaki to come through via CERN. How's that? That's my good enough. That's my. I haven't thought about Steve Quayle in so long. But ten dollars from argument, please. I sent a question earlier. You didn't answer it. I'm sorry. I did answer it by handing it over to Father Deacon Ananias. What's the argument that concludes? Point one of tag so why would point one conclude when it's point one and the whole point is that it's a meta level argument you claim you're using logic at the meta level prove it again we already have proven that go watch the live stream go read his paper aspiring fast boy five dollars you should unblock redeem zoomer uh, i'll pass on that he says he's reading the church fathers and he's ready for a part two well i didn't say i was ready for a part two but 
I guess it's good that he's, re- well, him, quote, reading the church fathers probably means he's just, quote, mining them for whatever he thinks looks Protestant, which is natural. I did the exact same thing at his age. Noah M. $5. I dabbled in Romanism before becoming Orthodox. I enjoyed the rosary. Can I venerate the Theotokos by the rosary? Um, I think that the problem isn't any of the phrases of the rosary or the theology necessarily of the rosary. The problem is that the rosary typically went along with this idea of imaginative prayer. And imaginative prayer is not part of orthodoxy. So I would say uh, that you would you should ideally speak about that to your spiritual father. But we don't need these Roman Catholic devotions. We don't need to import them into orthodoxy because it sends a, a message that, oh, well, we're all basically the same. We're not. Uh, Sacred Heart is a violation of the teachings of Ephesus. So you should not have the sacred heart worship in an Orthodox church. It, viol- it clearly violates Ephesus, which says that you can't give reverence to parts of Christ. You have to revere the whole Christ as the whole Christ. So, and the, and, and the, the motivation of many of the people, not you, Noah, but many of the people who want to do these things is not always good motivation. Some people's motivation is ecumenism. They want to give the impression that if we, and this is actually what Jesuits did. Jesuits, for example, would paint and have painted heterodox icons to try to convert Orthodox people to Unionism or Roman Catholicism. And so it's no different in terms of the motivation of bringing in all these Western Latin devotions. And listen, I was a Roman Catholic. We don't need that stuff. We don't need sitting there meditating and imagining myself in the, the, the pains of hell like lunatic Alfonso Liguori says. We don't want any of this stuff. We don't do imaginative prayer. So, no, that's the reason why. It's not, we don't want you, you know, thinking about the Theotokos or whatever. Um, any last words on that, Father? Be sure and uh, subscribe to uh, uh, all of my outlets. Uh, head on over to chalk.com. Use promo code J50 to get 50% off all those great products like chalk.com. And uh, you get 50% off things like the Irish Moss, 50% off things like Seven Wonders, 50% off the excellent Tone Catali, proven to boost testosterone. And we definitely know these church boys need to boost their testosterone. I'll tell you what. Uh, otherwise, I will see you guys very soon. Uh, get some of that Lore Coffee. The link is in the show description. Lore Coffee is our, our fellow Orthodox Coffee Bros. And you're also supporting uh, FDA as well by buying that Lore Coffee. Uh, subscribe to me on Rockfin. Uh, get the books, sign 